best intentions. I believe the proposed active whistleblower is nothing more than a false sense of protection. Much stronger measures are needed. The company was incorporated as a fully independent not-for-profit in 2004. A year later, it entered into performance agreement with the province of Ontario. This agreement was authored by the ministry and did not include any rights of the province over the independence of the company. I can only conclude this was either done in error or consciously or for a reason. Ontario Orange was not a government agency, as some have called it at this committee. The agreement did include comprehensive rights to audit, examine and investigate both financial and operational activities. There were a number of concerns about the performance agreement raised by the MNP audit and internally within government that were clearly the responsibility of the Ministry to resolve. As a Board of Orange, we had no right and no obligation to direct or even encourage the Ministry to resolve these issues. The province always had a right to renegotiate performance agreement at any time. I acknowledge the many issues and concerns that have been brought to the surface over the past two years. The most serious of these await the reports from the OPP as well as the coroner of the province. As a board, we took our responsibilities very seriously. In reaching our many decisions, we sought and received information from management, we sought out, consulted with and received independent advice, and we discussed and debated all major issues. We would then reach our decisions based on our best judgment in light of the information and advice we, we obtained. The testimony to date has indicated that some of the information provided to the board and on which the board, as did the ministry, had a right to rely may have been incomplete or incorrect. Whether the provision of inaccurate information to the board was done with intent or as a result of incompetence has yet to be determined. On a personal note, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the efforts of the many and, and many honest and hardworking members of the Orange team, both past and present. Thank you for your attention and time. I'd be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll move to the opposition. Mr. Please. Yeah, we'll go in 20-minute rotations and then see how much time is left. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've now heard from uh, four of your fellow directors. Uh, they were obviously well briefed in advance of their appearance before this committee. And uh, in listening to your prepared statement, obviously uh, the messaging is the same. Uh, essentially, uh, the decisions made by the board were based on information available to the board at the time. Uh, board members were obviously oblivious to the fact that patient care was being compromised. In fact, you uh, insist again that that didn't happen, notwithstanding the evidence to the contrary. Uh, the fact that uh, public funds were not used to subsidize for-profit uh, organizations, uh, there were no red flags that you could see, uh, and not one director has any regrets. Uh, and so, compliments to your counsel uh, for his guidance. I'd like to ask you this. Uh, when you met with your fellow directors in preparation for appearance before this committee, uh, did you yourself provide them some counseling in terms of what should or should not be said? The counseling that I provided, they asked me questions about what it was like to appear in front of this committee. And um, I told them it was a, a challenging and interesting exercise. And I uh, specifically, I believe, referred a couple of times to uh, the, uh, the confused line of questioning that may come about. And that's the degree of counsel I gave them. Were they uh, at any point uh, cautioned either by yourself or counsel uh, against admitting any failure of uh, oversight? Absolutely not. We did not have a single discussion regarding admission, non-admission or anything of that nature. There was no discussion between myself or any of my board members on that point. We learned from uh, previous uh, testimony that uh, the board of directors was uh, essentially hand-picked by you. Is that, uh, is that true? No, I don't think that's, uh, that's completely truthful. Um, the initial board of directors, um, I don't know uh, who picked uh, many of the initial board of directors back in, uh, uh, back in the days of uh, Ontario Ambulance Services Co. I believe um, if I'm correct, Dr. Lester testified that uh, he was asked to uh, sit on the board, as, was, as were a number of people from Sunnybrook and Women's. Um, 
I don't know how the other people got onto the board when I got onto the board, but I was asked uh, to come onto the board by, uh, by Dr. Mazza. And um, at the time, I believe that my name was also reviewed by uh, people at Sunnybrook and Women's and within the ministry to uh, ascertain whether that, you know, I was a reasonable person to come onto the board. Subsequent to that, um, I did, uh, as was testified by Mr. Pickford and uh, um, uh, Beth Ann Coley, um, I did, in fact, um, after some prior uh, discussions with uh, uh, our Compensation and, and Nominations Committee um, about the fact that there were a number of people uh, in the ICD program that I had the opportunity to be with for a period of uh, 16 weeks or uh, 16 days over, I guess, uh, a longer period, um, going through business cases, presentations, analysis, uh, tax issues, and many other things, I had the opportunity to uh, come in contact with some very experienced uh, people. So and the question we, is... And, you... and just allow me to finish, please. Well. And um, I mentioned this to, uh, to, to Dr. Mazza and to uh, Luis Navas, who was on the comp and uh, a nominations committee at the time. I said, uh, look, we, you know, we should take the opportunity to, uh, to look for board members that filled the, the need as we saw it for particular expertise and experience. And in that regard, I approached a number of people uh, during the course of time after I satisfied myself that they were pretty good and um, um, talked to them about Orange and some of them agreed to uh, uh, talk to Dr. Mazza and consider uh, coming onto the board. Okay. Here's the reason why it's a little frustrating uh, for us on this committee. We know what you're doing. Uh, I'm asking very specific questions. Uh, you're spending a, a good deal of our time uh, here uh, expounding far beyond uh, anything that I'm interested in. Well, ask uh, a I, specific I would ask, question. I would I'll ask, be happy to well, answer. It causes, it causes me to uh, question your intent. If we could, uh, I, would, uh, I would just ask you, uh, because we have limited time, uh, if you could keep your responses specific to the questions I'm asking. The, uh, when you met uh, Mr. Pickford and Ms. Coley uh, at the Institute, uh, were you teaching a class there or were you a student? Of no, I was a student. I was taking the class. Okay. Did that class uh, include um, any reference to director's fiduciary duties or duty of loyalty and duty of care? It did. And um, did you as chair, when, when you became the chair, did you ever discuss those responsibilities with uh, members of your board? Considering that um, the majority of members of the board at the time were ICD graduates, um, we certainly conduct ourselves consistent with those responsibilities, yes. The Industry Canada uh, primer for directors of not-for-profit corporations states that duty of care includes a general obligation to, and I quote, among other things, oversee all aspects of operation and maintain a supervisory role over tasks which have been delegated. Uh, given what we know, and I know that in your opening statement, uh, you're asserting that um, your responsibilities were uh, at a higher level We've now heard from uh, more than 50 uh, witnesses here who would differ with you uh, in terms of what was going on on the front line, in terms of the patient care uh, that was uh, being delivered. Patient care was compromised. That was as a result, uh, as we heard here, uh, of downstaffing, which was uh, a policy uh, of Orange that was implemented uh, while you were chair and while your fellow directors uh, were responsible for that operational oversight. Uh, we had testimony here that um, numerous patients were put at risk because the new helicopters to which you refer that uh, you oversaw the purchase of uh, had interiors that prevented paramedics from even, uh, e even doing uh, the very basic uh, life-saving procedure. And uh, we heard testimony here uh, about uh, a, a paramedic plant in uh, a location uh, in London uh, being shut down 
because there weren't sufficient funds. All of this going on, uh, Mr. Belzner, while you as chair and your fellow directors uh, were putting the stamp and approval uh, on an expansion of uh, a scheme uh, that was brought to you by uh, Mr. Mazza, uh, core services here that you were mandated to oversee of patient care uh, were being shortchanged while you were experimenting uh, w with some scheme. How does that fit into uh, the definition of fiduciary responsibility? How, how can you justify uh, telling us here today uh, that you carried out your duty of care as a director knowing that patient care was put at risk I'd be interested in that. I'm sure the many patients and their families uh, who were affected by what was going on at Orange over that time would like to know that as well. I'm going to try and interpret your question, which was rather lengthy. First of all, we did not know that patient care was at risk. I've testified very clearly that we had a medical advisory committee, as does every hospital, we looked to the Medical Advisory Committee that is made up of very competent physicians to provide the board with insight um, into the actions on patients. We as a board were very careful to always ask the Medical Advisory Committee to report on any and all adverse events and any time as I testified where there was a change in policy that would seem to potentially affect patients in Ontario, we asked the Medical Advisory Committee to specifically study this so that we could be assured as a board that in fact patients in Ontario were looked after. I would disagree with your statement that we knew that patients were not being looked after. So you, uh, your answer of course is that you relied on your we had, a relight, we had an absolute right to rely on a medical advisory committee, as does the board of a hospital. And you took no other outside information in the, into consideration? That is not correct either. The outside information that we took were the reports on patient transports that came from uh, our chief operating officer, and we relied on the information as we had a right to rely on that information from him. We also received information from um, uh, our patient survey uh, individual that conducted patient surveys and reported back to the board and nothing came up in any of those reports that would suggest that there was any uh, detriment to patients in Ontario. In fact, many of the actions that we took over the courses I testified were there to specifically improve patient service and reliability. So you were not aware uh, of the investigations? Uh, that were ongoing, uh, some uh, 13 in 2007, uh, 10 in 08, uh, 19 in 2009, 14 in 2010, uh, 28 in 2011, 35 in 2012, 26 of those involving uh, a patient who died. Uh, you're telling me that as a chair of the board and, and, and the board of directors had no idea uh, that these investigations uh, were going on. Uh, 24 of those had been referred to the coroner. You're telling me that as a director and as a chair you didn't know anything about this. I'm going to repeat what my testimony was and that, was, that we relied on the MAC to report to us any situation where there was an adverse impact on a patient. None of those reports included, to the best of my knowledge and is documented in our files, any reference to investigations by the coroner. We certainly did not communicate with the coroner independently of the MAC to ask that question. Can I ask you um, how involved uh, you were uh, in decisions at Orange relating to the expansion and, and essentially a, a lot of diversion of uh, uh, Chris Mazza's focus uh, on the expansion scheme uh, that, uh, that your board approved? 
At the appropriate time, I was, I would say, I was quite extensively involved, particularly in, in the fall of uh, 2010, after we had uh, stabilized the, uh, the transition of rotor and, and fixed wing issues and so on. Um, and my active involvement was as a participant on the, uh, on the special committee to the board, uh, reviewing the transaction, or proposed transaction. And then, of course, I was also quite actively involved in, uh, in January of 2011, uh, where I, uh, with the help of um, legal counsel at the time, uh, put together a fairly lengthy and detailed letter, uh, which I wanted to uh, make sure of uh, was communicated to government uh, to ensure that government was fully aware of each and every action that we were proposing to take. And then, of course, I was also intimately involved in the three presentations to the three ministries attended by uh, probably 30, 40 uh, different government officials. Um, and none of those individuals or anyone else, quite frankly, um, ever said one negative thing about our proposed action. In fact, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Saad Rafi, who was Deputy Minister of Health, um, uh, asked me directly whether or not uh, the ministry could uh, participate as an investor in, in Global. So it, it would be fair to say that um, uh, as chair of the board, uh, you were one of the strongest advocates of uh, uh, Chris Mazza's expansion uh, proposals. Is that, uh, is that fair? I was one of the strongest advocates of doing, doing it properly, taking it through an independent committee, through, taking it through the right process, uh, protecting the, uh, the assets of, um, of Ontario and of Orange, uh, and ensuring that patient care was uh, not compromised, absolutely. Isn't that a rather odd role for, for the chair uh, of a board of directors to play? Uh, I don't think so. One would think uh, that the board is there not as a, a marketing arm uh, of the CEO, uh, but rather as an oversight responsibility. Would you not agree? I don't see that uh, we were a marketing arm of the CEO. I don't agree with that. Well, your name uh, is uh, at the bottom of the letter that uh, makes the presentation to the ministry. I don't think the presentation to the ministry was a marketing presentation. I don't understand where you get that. Well, uh, all the, you have to do that's, is read that's it. That's your opinion. It's not mine. It's a, it, it certainly is not just an objective. It, it's, it's a sales It's a black and white objective statement of facts and, and uh, uh, business plans. That's all it is. Uh, did it take the board of directors to approve that scheme? Yes. And uh, given the fact that um, a good proportion of that board was directly appointed by you, uh, to what degree... I, I disagree with that statement. Uh, you, you keep on coming up with a statement that, you know, a goodly portion of the board was uh, directly appointed many, by me. The board the appointed board? new directors. Let's how be clear people, about that. How many people were on the board? Two people on the board were people that I identified as potential board members. And Dr. Mazza, did he vote? Dr. Vaza had no vote. Yeah, why did he not have a vote? He was uh, a, a non-voting director on the board. Was he getting paid? No. Was Dr. Mazza getting paid for being on the board? Yes. No. Do you want to uh, think about that again? I don't believe I need to think about that again. To the best I of my knowledge, Dr. Mazza was not being paid to be on the board. Well, I have here invoices uh, from Dr. Chris Mazza to Orange, I'll just read, I have numerous invoices here, sure I'll just do. read it to you. Uh, board teleconference tele meeting, $250. Governance committee meeting, $500. Operations meeting, $750. Finance meeting, $500. He was getting paid. Well, did you, you know, one of the things that doesn't that? surprise me, one of the things that doesn't surprise me, Mr. Cleese, um, yeah. as has been evidenced through testimony already, is that Dr. Mazza was uh, receiving compensations or payments from all sorts of areas. Um, and that one is another one that I can assure you I did not know of, the board did not know of. I suggest perhaps you might ask the uh, chief financial officer as to why the Chief Financial Officer approved that. Well, the signature on here uh, is uh, Ms. Renzella. Um, so you, um, you're suggesting that uh, Ms. Renzella was uh, rogue on this? 
All I can suggest to you is that it appears that many of the payments that uh, did not receive the approval of the board appear to receive the approval or signature of Ms. Rosella. So I don't know what that means, and I believe the OPP is the one that should be investigating that point. I have no other information with respect to that. Okay. I, um, I'll leave it at that and uh, come back. Okay, very well. We'll move to the uh, NDP. Ms. Jelenis. Thank you for coming again. And um, Thank I you, will I think. Uh, actually, before I start with my prepared question, I have a question about the uh, um, documents that you read into the record. Uh, my first one has to do with, uh, I'm on page three, if you have the same uh, page as us, um, of the document you read, and you're basically talking about your uh, uh, responsibility as a board member, and in yes. your case as a board chair. Um, I'm about on the second paragraph where you start and say, uh, through our various board committee, we sought to dwell even deeper into strategic operational and financial matters, once again making use of ex exhaustive management report provided to the board, as well as presentation from management. Uh, you remember telling us yes. that? Okay, so the, the strategic plan that was presented, the way I call it, the 11-page document that was uh, signed by you, presented uh, by Mr. Apps and you to uh, the people of the ministry, uh, this is something that your board and yourself knew inside and out. You knew that you were going to create this new corporate structure. Um, you had a plan. You agreed with it? Yes. Okay. And uh, you, uh, you communicated uh, that information to the people at the Ministry of Health? Absolutely. Black and white and verbally. Okay. And would you say that the full content of the strategic plan as contained in that memo uh, was communicated when you had a chance to meet with the people at the Ministry of Health? Yes, that's, uh, that's documented by the presentation deck in PowerPoint that accompanied the, uh, the meetings. Okay, and you had time in your meeting to go through the deck and to go through all of the uh, different elements of what I would call the presentation of your new strategic plan? Would what would you call it? Um, well, first of all, it, with respect to the question of did we have time, yes, I was very pleased with the amount of time provided by all of the ministries, and uh, there was no rushing people out the door. Uh, we had plenty of time to present. There was plenty of time on discussion um, and clarification, and uh, that's what happened. Okay. And just so that I know how to refer to it, how would you refer to that letter? I would refer to that letter as our uh, proposed um, uh, strategic plan for uh, for the company, yes. That's how I saw it too. Yeah. So I'll call it your proposed strategic plan. So yeah. you felt that you had plenty of time to talk to the to the people, present your full, pre do the full presentation, and uh, were any of the questions that were posed to you lead you to believe that they were uncomfortable? There were certainly questions uh, posed which related to uh, clarifying uh, the relationship between one entity and another, uh, so clarifying questions, but there was not a single question that led me to believe or, quite frankly, um, uh, my fellow participants that came with me to suggest that there was any concern whatsoever um, by the people asking the questions. And objectively, no one sent a letter or no one called or sent an email saying, we don't like your plan, we have a problem with it, don't go ahead with it or pause. You know, thank you for that question. I, I can tell you I was not very pleased to hear, subsequently as testimony to this committee, um, from, the, uh, from the Deputy Minister, for example, that he had concerns. In the weeks following the presentation at which the Deputy Minister was the prime individual, and before we as a board finally gave the, the final approval to, to go forward in the subsequent weeks, there was nothing that ever came back, either verbally, written, email, uh, voicemail, uh, pigeons, or any other form of communication. Um, I don't mean to be light on this point, but I'm, 
as you can well imagine, more than a little irritated by this fact. No, it's absolutely important. That's why I want to say objectively, if there was any concerns raised, if you received any correspondence. Ms. Chella, my confidence, and, and I think the confidence of my team, came about from not only the uh, many years of prior seeming support from government, uh, but also by the fact that uh, the individuals that were in the room appeared to understand what we were doing, uh, certainly appeared to, uh, you know, they had some good questions to clarify things, and certainly appeared to be very positive about it. Um, so that, uh, you know, after the first meeting, uh, that was the message that we took. Uh, we then had a second meeting with another ministry uh, that was focused uh, from a little bit different aspect, the finance ministry, for example. And they had some very uh, good questions, clarifying questions, but nothing in the least bit raising a concern. And then the final uh, meeting, once again. So over a period of, of many weeks, um, I believe there was more than ample opportunity for the government through whichever ministry or through whichever ADM or DM uh, to communicate uh, to either uh, someone in orange or to the board, preferably, because it was the board doing the presentation about any concern, and there was nothing. Could it be that uh, those people communicated with uh, the operational side of orange and that never came back to you? Could there is nothing that I have heard since then that suggests in any way that there was any communication at all with anybody at Orange. I fully agree with you. I have asked this question of 50 witnesses and got the exact I know you have. Answer. I've read the testimony and uh, I have said in my opening statement, you know, I failed to understand and I wish this committee would investigate the point of why there was no communication, whether that was by accident, deliberate or whatever. But they certainly, the government kept us in the dark. I will make that statement time and time again. Can you, in your mind, with your experience and whatever else you can draw on, um, put together a scenario that could explain how, on one side, we have a deputy minister that says they were concerned, they tried to communicate with you, they were roadblocks and they, they couldn't, and then what the other 50 witnesses have said have <laughs> said exactly the opposite. Can you imagine a scenario where what you're saying and what the deputy and the minister is saying could be part of the same reality? Michelle, um, I've had over 30, 30 years of experience with government in all forms, federal, provincial, municipal. Um, I've never seen this. I cannot imagine why this should have happened. Uh, mind you, having watched the legislature over the last uh, month or so on other topics, um, I have to say I, con I continue to be surprised in how things are done. That's my only comment. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so this is where I'm coming from. So just so you, you understand my, my perspective. I think that uh, in any transfer payment agency, boards are going to come, they're going to go. Uh, some might be excellent, some may not be so good. But at the end of the day, my position is that the buck stops with the government. They provide the oversight. Uh, given that context, that's where I'm coming from. And I think the government should certainly have oversight and, and should have had oversight over Orange. Uh, but given all that, now with all your hindsight, where do you think the board, I mean, because many of the things that went on, the, the compensation that shouldn't have went on, um, you know, some of the patient issues that shouldn't have, shouldn't have went on, these issues went on with the board, you know, with the board intact. What could the board have done differently? I mean, now with absolute hindsight and given the fact that, you know, you relied on information that may have been uh, inaccurate, what could the board have done now if you went back in time and spoke to yourself and said, listen, you know, uh, Mr. Beltzner, my, my younger self, this is what you need to do to get to the bottom of this. That doesn't happen. What could you have done? Mr. Singh, I can assure you that um, I've asked myself that question a hundred times. I have no doubt my fellow board members have asked that question themselves a hundred times. I don't think there is anything that uh, we could have done differently, quite frankly. Um, I've asked myself the question of, well, when could signals have gone up earlier? Um, 
when was there opportunity? We heard of the concerns uh, expressed about uh, financing of uh, helicopters and fixed wing. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this was not a secret at all. Uh, the, the raising of funds was something that was carefully discussed with the Ontario Financing Authority. If there was ever a question of concern, an initial flag might have gone up there um, that the government wasn't happy. No concern. Certainly the MNP audit um, raised a number of questions about the performance agreement. I'm no expert on performance agreements. I'll admit that. But what I do know is that the performance agreement is a document that the government produces to set out the roles and responsibilities for others to perform under their watchful eye. The performance agreement, to my surprise, contained no, uh, you know, left orange completely independent, but still with the rights of government to oversee and examine everything. This was a rare instance. I mean, I, I, I've gone back now and looked at other performance agreements. This is a rather unusual one. You know, so perhaps, you know, there was an opportunity for government to raise signals earlier, uh, but not, there's nothing there that I can see that we as a board could have done or might have done earlier. Um, I believe very strongly that we did everything that was necessary to do carefully um, and with the belief that we had uh, full honesty and transparency from management and full honesty and transparency from the government. Okay. My colleague has more questions. So I'm going to bring you back to the performance agreement, uh, specifically when the MNP audit had raised a number of performance agreement compliance issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm on page eight of your document, right. if you're interested, uh, where you say that uh, they were appropriately resolved and subsequently monitored by the board through specific management reporting. However, the board was concerned about the delay in the ministry's reporting of external concern. And you go on to say uh, that you went on to um, write a letter. And um, I'll read it exactly. In 2008, a formal letter was sent to uh, Ruth Hawking yes. and uh, advised it specifically request that the ministry advise it as in orange and on a timely basis of any concern it became aware of. This, this is rather unusual for an agency to ask in writing. Excuse of, me, we're not an agency. So where are, where a, are you? A not an independent not-for-profit. By definition, there are three types of agencies agency of government. Agency, boards and commission, you're not one yeah. of those. You're Correct. a... Uh, Okay, I call you a transfer payment agency. You're not a TPA? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't classify as a transfer payment agency. Okay. I classify as an independent not-for-profit, or okay. Orange. So, uh, Orange, uh, it's rather unusual for Orange to write to the ministry asking it to uh, basically don't delay on reporting external concern. Like, could you lead me through what brought you to do this? Certainly. Um, you know, this had to do with a, uh, uh, a complaint that the ministry had received from, um, I'm searching my memory, uh, Mr. Walmsley, I believe, mm -hmm. um, who had written the government about uh, some concerns about us keeping double sets of books and things of that nature. The letter was received by government, I believe, some six, seven, or eight months prior to uh, Ruth Hawkins calling me and, uh, and having a conversation with regards to this letter. Uh, we, of course, responded immediately and in depth, uh, very open to um, audits coming in, examining, and, and so on. But I was concerned on the question of, you know, why does it take six, seven, eight months to communicate something which clearly would be of concern to the board? So, you know, I spoke to Ruth Hawkins about it at the time and expressed that I was, um, I had never seen this before. My experience with government is that, uh, you know, in my years, uh, when there was a concern, they always called me up and, you know, said, can we work this out or something? So I decided, um, as I'm often apt to do, to put it in writing and wrote to her in, in my letter. Um, and I said, look, you know, 
you need to communicate concerns on a timely basis, especially if they come in from external parties. We want, as a board, to know about this. We want to be able to deal with it. So that's why that, uh, that item was in there. It was a very, very specific request. And uh, you figure things could have turned out differently if uh, the whistleblower, that was Mr. Wormsley, did blow the whistle to the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health took seven months to pick up the phone and tell you about it. And you went on to do your investigation. Uh, would things have turned differently had they picked up the phone seven months earlier? No, I don't think so. Uh, it, it, the only thing that would have been different is I wouldn't have included that comment in my letter to Ruth Hawkins. <laughs> okay. Um, you go on to say this request was seemingly not complied with. It was not until early 2012 that I and some other board member learned of the existence, and they had never. So basically, you are made aware of one whistleblower that has gone to uh, the ministry and seven months later they call you, you do an investigation, and then nothing till 2012? And then nothing until 2012. So I know and, that... And I, and I refer, for example, there's a very specific item that came up in uh, January of, t of 2012 um, which was a, uh, a fairly lengthy and, and quite comprehensive letter from a group of uh, aviation companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that's in the, the files somewhere. Yes, um, you know, I, I and a couple of my board members were presented with this letter um, in early 2012. It was written, I think, at least a year earlier. Uh, first time that we've seen it. And you have to ask yourself the question, why was this not forwarded to the board? Did you ask that question? It was actually written in November 2010. Well, we certainly asked that question of ourselves. I don't think um, we had the, uh, shall we say, lines of communication with the ministry <laughs> open at the time. Okay. But you heard no answer as to why? I have, I have not heard in any testimony here. Um, or in any discussion as to why that letter was suppressed. And you haven't, the ministry never contacted you about any other whistleblower that had gone to the ministry? I received no other contact about any other whistleblower that had gone to the ministry at all, and neither, to the best of my knowledge, had any of my board members. You have about two and a half All together? No, it will be, you'll get another round. Okay. The uh, kind of disrupted my train of thought there, Norm. Uh, the uh, okay, I think I'll wait and add it to my second round. Okay, to go to the government, Ms. Jasser. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Belsner, hey. you'll notice that there are some new uh, faces since you were yes. last here. Mr. McNeely is a, a fixture, however. Uh, I'd like to go uh, back a little bit in terms of when did you first meet Dr. Mather? Um, it would have been late 2004, early 2005, somewhere around there. Uh, what, how did you meet? Uh, Dr. Mazza, uh, I was uh, working at the time for a large management consulting firm and uh, uh, specializing obviously in, in public sector practice and so on. Dr. Mazza called me up one day and asked me whether or not I could um, help him um, look at his current uh, staffing and his current um, workload and do an assessment of whether the current staffing met the current workload requirements. At Sunnybrook with the uh, That was, uh, he was located uh, at a facility on Shepherd Avenue. And what capacity, what was his work at that point? Well, he was uh, responsible for the um, uh, base ambulance program operator of Sunnybrook. So he employed you? Uh, you, you he hired me as he, a he consultant, hired, hired, hired my firm. Okay. Yes. And so you had frequent uh, interactions with Dr. Mazza uh, after that? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say frequent. I mean, I went to that location. I interviewed most of the, uh, the staff, and there were only, I think, five or six staff at the time. Um, uh, some staff uh, responsible for uh, paramedic training, 
um, there were no administrative staff because, of course, all of the uh, administration was being handled by Sunnybrook and Women's. Um, out of uh, non-province uh, billings were handled out of the ministry. Dispatch was handled out of the ministry. So it's a very small staff. Did you deliver a report? I uh, did. Have we ever seen that? Uh, I don't believe so. I would like to have a copy table, please, that report. I don't have a copy of the report. Oh. But this is, this is now, what, over 10 years ago? Or yeah, that range I'm of, just sort of exploring uh, the relationship yeah, no, I, I, you have. I don't have a copy of the report, but it would have been, you know, a standard, um, I would call, bearing point management consulting report uh, that says, you asked us to do this, this is how we did it, here are the results, uh, thank you very much. Do you remember whether you found the service adequate, or do you remember the results of your report? Uh, to the best of my recollection, uh, there were some gaps in, um, uh, in the alignment of people to uh, activities. Um, and uh, I certainly would have uh, highlighted those in the report. Did Dr. Mazza adopt your recommendations? Do you know? Um, I honestly don't recall. Uh, subsequent to that, when did he, as you've told us, invite you or suggest that you might be in interested in the Board of Orange? As um, it probably would have been within the following year. I see. And did you find that at all unusual, that you would be approached by someone who was uh, apparently going to be the CEO? I haven't heard of too many CEOs inviting board members to book well, as, as I under on their board. Well, as I don't think Dr. Mazza was CEO at the time. He was responsible for um, the, uh, the, the uh, base hospital operation on behalf of Sunnybrook and Women's. And as far as uh, I understood, and this is going back through you know, some material provided by previous testimony that um, Dr. Mazza had been uh, dealing with uh, a variety of different uh, ministers or deputy ministers of health, uh, as well as the Board of Sunnybrook, with a vision to um, consolidate uh, a, a in, I think in, in Dr. Mazza's view, I would be fair to say he viewed it as a fractured uh, air ambulance system uh, in Ontario. So uh, at some point, I mean, you, you heard Dr. Lester um, testify that the first step was the creation of the Ontario Air Ambulance Services Co. Inc. But the proposal from Dr. Mazza to yourself was that you be the chair of this new entity. Well, I first came on to uh, the OASC board uh, as a member, and then uh, when uh, the other member, when, when that was changed, uh, I became chair, yes. So you, at first you were just a member of the board when it was Correct. Ontario Air Ambulance. Correct. And Dr. Lester was there as, from Sunnybrook. Correct. Correct. How big was the, uh, that board? How many members? Uh, when Sunnybrook was involved, I, I honestly can't remember. It could have been seven or eight or something. Seven or eight. Yeah. And then subsequent to that, did you take this course, the ICD? I did, yes. And that's where you met Mr. Pickford and uh, Ms. Yeah, Cole. that was many years later. Yeah. Many years later? Yeah. I see. So you were on the board, and then many years later, you decided to take the course? I was on the board, and then uh, I forget when I took the course. It probably was uh, 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. Um, when uh, you... Uh, well, it must have been 2007, because that's when I met... Uh, Mr. Pickford and uh, Beth Ankoli. During the time 2004 to 2007, how would you describe your relationship with Dr. Mazza? Um, you know, a client relationship. Uh, then um, I would say uh, nothing other than a uh, business relationship. There was certainly no personal relationship. So it was a bit of a reverse. First, uh, you were his... Uh, you provided a service to him, and now you were management, and he was staff, essentially. Uh, yes. Um, when you, you took the course yeah. and you recruited some new members, um, we heard from them that, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, you approached them directly. Um, during that time, we do have uh, in our documentation a report from the Globe and Mail by Karen Howlett, uh, dated February 15th, and uh, a board member at the time, one Enola Stoyle, uh, apparently uh, was asked to resign from the board or her 
uh, time on the board was going to be terminated. Could you tell us a little bit about the conversation you had uh, with Ms. Doyle? Yes, the, um, the situation arose from a particular board meeting when um, uh, wherein Ms. Doyle uh, made some, um, and I would characterize them as inappropriate personal comments uh, to Dr. Mazza, um, which were quite surprising. Um, this led to a discussion uh, with Dr. Mazza who was rightfully upset about those comments. It led to a discussion with um, uh, Luis Navas, who was uh, head of the Compensation uh, Governance and Compensation Committee. And um, then uh, subsequently I had a discussion with uh, Enola. Um, and during that discussion, um, I think we reached the appropriate conclusion that um, uh, the relationship between uh, Enola and uh, Dr. Mazza uh, was not going to get much better, uh, that uh, it was a relationship that went beyond, uh, I would say, um, uh, a board's, you know, typical board director's uh, uh, participation on a board, uh, got a little personal, and uh, as a result, uh, I think we mutually agreed that it would be a good idea for her to step down from the board. Now, according to what she was is quoted in this article in the Globe and Mail, she, her version of events was that uh, she had disagreed with the establishment of a charitable foundation. I think it was the J. Smart piece, uh, using taxpayers' money. Do you, do you remember that that uh, was the situation? Well, she certainly, best of my recollection, um, that's a correct statement, but that's not why she... Uh, left the board. What did you think about her judgment related to the establishment of this foundation? She had her view. Um, we had a, a long discussion at, at the full board about um, the establishment of um, uh, that particular charity and uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that um, in that particular instance Enola had one view and other board members had another view. How many people were on the board at that time? Um, now you're pressing my memory. Um, six. I see. Uh, did you think that was a good number to have? Well, you know, for um, a private not-for-profit, it's not an unusual number. I mean, I understand that hospital boards have, you know, 16 or more. Certainly my experience uh, as chair of the board of Humber College, uh, you know, I had 16 or, or so board members as stipulated uh, under the various legislation, certainly at TSSA, uh, which is um, a delegated authority of the Ontario government, there were 13 members on the board, seven uh, from industry, six appointed by government. Uh, but That's fine, thank you. You know, um, corporate boards, that's not unusual. Um, Carver, of course, anyone who's studied corporate governance is usually in the range of 8 to 12. Uh, subsequent... Well, I, wouldn't, uh, I don't want to disagree with Mr. Carver, but, uh, you know, I, I studied Carver quite extensively and, uh, and have lectured on uh, the Carver's theory. And I think uh, many not-for-profits would, uh, would agree that Carver's theories are not exactly the correct ones. Uh, at the end of 2011, how many members were on the board? At the end of 2011, let me see, um, would have been roughly the same number. Wasn't about six. Yeah, about six. Yeah. So we have interviewed four plus you, so who are we missing? Uh, I think uh, you're missing uh, Lauren Crawford, who's deceased. I see. And unfortunate. Uh, so uh, essentially we uh, can now deal with five members of the board as it... Uh, uh, through 2008 to 2011? Well, from 2008 until uh, uh, late 2010 or early 2011, before Mr. Crawford passed away, um, we had uh, we had six members of the board, um, uh, three, four of whom had gone through the ICD program, one of whom was a um, uh, an aviation uh, expert, and that's uh, Mr. Lowe, and. Uh, um, one of whom was a physician, and that's Dr. Lester, yes. I'd just like to turn now to remuneration. Yes. Uh, when you started on the board, how much uh, was your remuneration?
In 2005, um, as a not-for-profit, uh, and not charitable status, but as a not-for-profit, my remuneration according to Orange Records, uh, as provided to me by legal counsel at Orange, was $11,675. And in 2011? In 2006, if I may just continue. No, uh, I'd prefer not. I'd just like to hear 2000, 2011. In 2011, the total remuneration was $221,750. And where did that uh, remuneration come from? I previously testified to that point. It's in my Please previous testimony. our memories. The remuneration for 2011 came from um, uh, the for-profit company Orange Peel, the for-profit company um, that's fiscal year ended 2011, not calendar year. Uh, the for-profit company Orange Air, um, my services um, as a member of uh, the various committees, um, separate meetings with the AG, uh, and participation on the independent committee, uh, which uh, I think uh, 155,000 was made up of the various retainers and 66,750 was as a result of um, additional meetings. Did uh, any of the money come from the Ontario taxpayer? I, I would expect um, that, yes, some of it did. Do you not find that inappropriate? Orange was under a performance agreement with the government of Ontario as an independent not-for-profit. Um, but you seem to have emphasized to Ms. Jelina the independent nature of this corporation. Yes. For which you were the chair of the board and ultimately responsible. Yes. I'm sorry, what's the question? So the question is, don't you think it's inappropriate to use Ontario taxpayer dollars for your work on a for-profit uh, corporation, essentially, which is what you turned Orange into? The company was received monies from the Ontario public the government um, under what I viewed and, and what legal counsel has always told us was a commercial contract. We're not an agency um, of government. Um, so and you could do with it what you wanted? No, not at all. It's for the benefit of uh, Ontarians, absolutely. Tell me how you spent your time, say, during 2011, earning 200000 as the chair of Orange. Uh, you had quarterly board meetings with your small board of five individuals. Uh, what did you do in between time? Sort of describe how many hours a week you were working for Orange. Probably through the course of um, uh, 2010, the calendar tree year 2010, uh, through to um, March, April 2011, um, I could well have spent uh, um, 1,500 hours on orange and orange-related uh, matters. Give me some examples. Uh you were interested, as you have told us, with a patient focus. Were you looking at response times, amount of time of uh, aircraft availability? I mean, Absolutely. That's a lot I of think hours. you know. I think as um, uh, first of all, as, as you know, has been testified, we ended up with uh, a large number of entities, um, uh, including the for-profit subsidiary companies, is your trust, uh, real estate company, and so on. And each of these entities had its own board meetings and had its own financials. So was the bulk of your time spent on looking at these corporate entities? And uh, the, No, I, you know, the, the bulk of my time, and I, and I should say that, you know, if I say I spent 1,500 hours on, on Orange over the course of uh, the year, um, bear in mind that Orange, the main company, uh, was a charity, and uh, there was no remuneration received for that time. And I would say I probably spent uh, most of my time on, on Orange and the Orange Foundation, which again was a charity. Um, and there was no billings for that, um, of course. And how much revenue did these charities uh, generate in terms of the foundation? 
Um, I don't have the financial records in front of me. I'm sure you can have access to that. It's certainly in the millions of dollars. And that was from which particular project? Uh, again, you're, you're trying to test my memory on this. Um, there were a number of projects, both small, uh, large and small. I seem to recall um, there was a project uh, uh, at the charity that uh, raised funds uh, for um, uh, young children transfers. Um, you have a particular medical term for that, um, for dealing with babies and... Pediatric? Pediatric transport, yes. That was, uh, uh, we had a program to uh, establish a pediatric transport uh, uh, program and that was uh, funded through uh, a very generous donor. Um, then of course we but had... For operating uh, costs or for uh, capital Capital, capital and, and um, you know the various equipment uh, mm -hmm. uh, necessary to outfit our helicopters and fixed wing with pediatric. I think uh, pediatric programs were at the time where movements of, of uh, pediatric patients were handled predominantly by a hospital in Ottawa and, and one in Toronto maybe one in London if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, you would know this better than I. So, the, um, and, and this often required uh, specialized staff uh, to, from the hospital to come along. Um, and so there was but a- presumably that was funded through the public dollars, the actual transport. Well, the actual transport, as any patient in Ontario would, would be funded through public dollars. Okay. But I'm so saying, so your question on fundraising, so th there was fundraising there. Uh, there was certainly fundraising uh, direct fundraising from the major suppliers to, uh, to Orange. Um, and did that fundraising then subsidize some of your remuneration? No, no, no. Monies that went into um, all the fundraising that uh, was done, uh, there, were, there were two fundraising types. One uh, that dealt with uh, donor-specific requests, um, which uh, for the most part uh, typically dealt with, you know, put the money into a particular piece of equipment or something of that nature. And then there was fundraising of a general nature to pay for the administrative costs of the foundation. Um, for example, the foundation had an executive director and the costs of that executive director uh, were paid for by non-dedicated or non-specific donor dollars. So for example, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I did fundraising with, uh, uh, with a club that I belong to. Uh, I did orange fundraising within that club. And uh, we, we fundraised it even as directors. We contributed significant dollars uh, to the foundation uh, as, uh, for general purpose dollars. You don't remember what you mean by significant dollars? Well, in terms uh, of what I donated? Well, certainly it was in the thousands. Okay. Now, Medical Advisory Committee, I'd just like to pursue yeah. that. Who attended from the Medical Advisory Board? <coughs> and you're, the board you're on your last minute. Just okay, I'll just ask this one okay. before the next round. Who, who attended from the MAC? Yes. Okay, it was uh, Dr. Well, uh, the first chair of the Medical Advisory Committee was uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bruce uh, Sadwaski. And uh, uh, so he would attend. Um, he was then. Uh, um, replaced in some years later by Dr. Yen Chao, um, who would come to the, uh, to the committee. Um, but it's generally those two individuals. Okay, we'll continue later. Very well, thank you. We'll move to the PC party. Mr. Cleese. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Belson, you spent considerable time in your opening uh, remarks uh, talking about uh, the dire strait uh, of Ontario's air ambulance service. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, when we read the offering memorandum uh, that your board um, approved for, was it $230 million, the initial offering? I think it was 275. 275 million. I think so. Uh, throughout that entire offering memorandum, uh, you speak glowingly to potential investors. Uh, about the strong history of uh, the air ambulance service, uh, the worldwide reputation uh, that that air ambulance service has. How could you do that, uh, knowing uh, what you told us uh, about the uh, state that the air ambulance system is in? Well, um, 
First of all, I think the reputation and capability of um, the air ambulance system is made up of uh, predominantly the frontline workers. Uh, they're the ones providing the medical care uh, and as well the patch physicians that, uh, that supervise direct them. The fact that um, on day one uh, we had a rather disastrous uh, communications infrastructure handed over to us um, did not need to be highlighted in the offering memorandum because we had fixed it by then. And in fact, we had fixed it very quickly uh, and without any interruption to, uh, to service. I can, I, you can just imagine uh, being handed over uh, an operation where the province-wide dispatch center collapses on day one. No backup, no recovery, nobody knows what to do. And you call that, sir, uh, a, uh, a strong uh, basis on which to boast about the air ambulance system, that well, you're now going out to raise $275 million absolutely. of debt offering. The, Can you tell us who bought into that debt offering? Who bought into that debt offering? Who ultimately took it up? I can't recall who the, uh, who the providers were. You don't? No, I don't. I don't recall. A pretty significant debt offering. You don't, do you remember one? Uh, Olmers? I, don't, I can't remember. Did any companies that you uh, are associated with or were associated with take that offering up? Not that I'm aware of. I wasn't involved in, um, in the roadshow on the debt offering. Uh, certainly there were a lot of negotiations going on with uh, TD, uh, Toronto Dominion Bank uh, that I believe had um, floated us a loan while this was going on. Uh, I think they were you know, intimately involved. We had um, experienced independent uh, financial advisors working on it. Um, but as to uh, who finally took it up and to what percentage, I honestly can't recall. Okay. Uh, we heard about the for-profit uh, entities and why they were put together. You spoke glowingly in your uh, extensive letter that was presented to the Ministry of Health about uh, uh, the opportunity that those for-profit entities would have to generate profit and ultimately supplement uh, Ontario's air ambulance service. Uh, did you really believe uh, that those for-profit entities uh, would become successful? Absolutely. Did you ever invest in them? No. Why? Well, for one, I don't have the money. So it's, I wasn't there as an investor. Why not? What for? Well, if it was going to be so successful, um, would you not want to be first at the table or at least, I, I, I at least this, indicate your willingness to invest I, in I these think companies? this is, uh, I, I don't know where you're going on this, but this kind of reminds me of a television show um, that is on periodically where investors, you know, where people come forward looking for investment. We're, we're on the board interested in securing additional sources of funds for Orange. We are not on the board in there to look at uh, you know, personal investments in, in something of this nature. We're certainly there, you know, certainly I believed in it, the rest of the board believed in it. Uh, we received lots of data that uh, suggested um, this was going to be uh, successful. Um, there have been strong expression of interest from, uh, from different parts of the globe uh, concerning Orange's uh, potential operations in their, in their geography. So all the indications were that uh, this was going to be successful. Did you get any shares in any of those corporations? Yes, yeah, subsequently um, we found out that uh, Dr. Mazza had allocated some shares uh, in this uh, company called o OGMI, which was the initial, initial if you like, uh, holding company of the limited partnership. A limited partnership, when it's created, has to have a, you know, has to have a partner that, that holds the shares, and, and this is the company that was created, and those shares would, of course, be significantly diluted as, as other uh, people come in to buy into uh, the limited partnership. Uh, as I understood it, uh, Dr. Mazza uh, had offered um, each of the board members uh, some, I don't know, half a, half a percent of a share or something. Um, we never uh, saw the shares. Um, uh, certainly, we never, uh, you know, this 
came as uh, you know news and all the rest of that. Uh, I can tell you that. Uh, Were minutes ever signed to uh, issue those shares? Pardon me. Were minutes signed to issue? I, those? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, OGMI was a company that um, uh, was, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Mazza and Maria Renzella and some other person might have been the officers of that company. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I had no insight into it. All right. So you, you found out that you had some yeah. shares, didn't know about it, uh, even though you were the chair of the board. Uh, you did sign off, I understand, on a series of loans to uh, Dr. Mazza, 450000 in July of 2011, yes. 500000 in July of 2010. And the security uh, for those loans, do you recall what they were? You and I had that discussion at the last testimony, and I yes. explained that to you, yes. I'd like you to explain it again, please. Well, I'd like to, uh, um, with all uh, respect, uh, so that I get it. Yes, from same. my client's perspective, it, we don't want to turn into a memory, memory exercise and someone's going to compare and contrast testimony from three different occasions before this committee over three different times. So uh, while I'm, he'll, I'm sure he'll do his best to help, help you uh, repeat uh, and go through the areas, uh, I want to okay, make that well, clear I, to the chair. Fair enough. Uh, <clears throat> let me remind you that uh, the security for one of those loans uh, were 5,101 Class A common shares uh, in Orange Global Management, Inc. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. What were those worth? I think, um, uh, I think the question you asked me the last time I was here was, um, uh, what did you think the value of uh, OGMI was? And I think I said something like uh, there have been numbers of $100 million thrown around. I believe that's what you asked. Yeah, I, I, rem I remember you remember telling that? me that they were worth uh, $100 million at the time, and I thought you might have had some time to think about it between now and then, uh, and you may want to revise your thinking. Uh, uh, so let me put the question differently. <laughs> It doesn't really matter what someone told you they were worth. As the chair of the board, you knew full well what the asset value of that company was. What is a realistic value that you could testify to that it, with all of your professional background and knowledge, those shares were actually worth? The best that I was able to testify is what I told you. I had no other basis. I mean, I there were some numbers that had been provided, uh, floating around about the potential market value of these shares in the future, and that's what it was. No, I'm not talking about the future. I'm talking about at the time that you signed this note and lent this man 450000 and took as security this paper, because surely that's all it was, was paper, and yet you signed off on that. You took as a pledge against a $450,000 loan paper. That's all it was worth at the time. Isn't that true? There's no question about that. Okay. Can I ask you where the money came from when the check was written out to Chris Mazza for $450,000 and again $500,000 in July of 2010 and in March of 2011 a $250,000 advance against his bonuses? Where did that money come from? What was the source of that money? The first of the, uh, the loans, which was a housing loan, which was provided by Orange Peel, I believe. Where did the money come from? Where did Orange Peel get that money? Orange Peel got that money as it got the money to pay Dr. Mazza's compensation and the compensation of, the other, of all employees of Orange Peel at the time came from uh, monies under the performance agreement. So it came from the taxpayers? came from money yes. under the performance agreement, yes. It's taken us 50-some witnesses to get to this point. So that particular, that particular loan, uh, housing loan to Dr. Massa, which I will uh, state is not an unusual thing to do, uh, came from monies uh, as a result of the commercial agreement between Orange and the province. The two other amounts um, came from monies, as far as I was led to believe, 
from monies uh, raised as a result of uh, the marketing agreement with Augusta Westland and other sources other than uh, funds from the performance agreement. In fact, I recall um, a uh, conversation with Maria Renzella uh, to say to Maria, um, are these funds available? Do we have the cash to do this? And she assured you that the funds were there. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're not certain that that money came from anywhere other. It may well have come from Orange, right? You know, Mr. Cleese, um, as provided by testimony to this committee a number of times from various sources, um, there certainly appear to be flows of money that um, uh, I and others in the board were not aware of. I'd like to I'd like to just talk about uh, the board and, and perhaps follow up a bit on Ms. Jasek's uh, questions. The uh, the current board uh, of Orange uh, is uh, being paid nothing. Uh, they're doing this um, uh, as public service. When I look at the bylaws that were signed by uh, yourself and uh, Chris Mazza originally, those bylaws provided for no remuneration for directors. Then there were a series of amendments to those bylaws over time that, by the way, what I find interesting is that Chris Mazza signed them as secretary. Uh, Which company are you speaking of? Well, I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Orange. Uh, Orange, the charity? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Chris Mazza is a... There was no remuneration for uh, board members of Orange charity. Well, no, the, these... Well, the, there are others here, too. I have an entire binder... Uh, that relate to Orange itself, not the charity, that also provide for no remuneration initially. Well, then they were changed. But here's my point. No. Here's my point. In addition to the fact that board members determined that they should be paid significantly, uh, what, what concerns me is when we go through the expenses, we also come across retreats by the board. Uh, Niagara on the Lake, an $8,000 bill here. Um, retreats in Florida, uh, another $12,000 or $14,000 bill. C can, can you tell me how, how you justify, you and your board members justify, at the same time that your frontline staff are bringing concerns to your management about understaffing, not enough paramedics, not enough uh, pilots, uh, about decisions that were made that your board must have known about uh, to shut down a paramedic uh, uh, base in, in, in London, and, and you feel quite good uh, about spending those dollars at a retreat um, where you could just as well have had those meetings in your head office, knowing the dire straits that uh, the organization was in. How do you justify that? The beginning part of your question uh, where you claim that um, we knew about this and that, I, I again dispute. Um, and you're, you're consolidating a multi-year timeline into a couple of instances. So let me uh, respond to the specific um, retreats as you call them. Um, the first retreat that we took was uh, to Kenora in the middle of February um, in which the board members uh, sat in a, a cold holiday inn room, I think it was, might have been something else for a day and then took right outs. Um, I believe the second retreat was uh, in fact one in Florida where we specifically went to Florida um, to see uh, a, an operation in Florida because we had wanted to get the board uh, a look at um, a similar sized or, or reasonably comparable type of operation to, to kind of see what they were doing. Because um, there's really nothing much else to, to look at uh, uh, around uh, Ontario, quite frankly. 
Uh, the other retreats that you mentioned, uh, whether it's uh, 6000 or $8,000 or whatever the case may be, uh, we did have one retreat, maybe two retreats in a um, facility in Niagara-on-the-Lake uh, because it was convenient. Um, uh, we did not have at the time, um, uh, I think in one of them, I don't think we had a, a room that was capable of handling um, uh, the presentations that were being done by um, external advisors on uh, insurance uh, plans and so on uh, that I recall. Um, so yes, we did uh, go off-site for a number of times. Uh, I don't think that's unusual. In fact, I seem to recall in my um, experience uh, on the board of uh, Humber College, um, you know, we attended um, uh, sessions in uh, different parts of Canada uh, on an annual basis, uh, which um, uh, was uh, paid for by Humber and uh, paid Mr. for Belson, by all of the thank colleges. You very much. You, you've answered so, my question, and, you know. and obviously there are no regrets there either. Uh, no, I think there were very fruitful meetings. Well, yeah, obviously fruitful. I, I would hope so. A according according to the receipts, uh, movies, uh, mini bars. Uh, you know, it wasn't. You could have got yourself a room here at Queens Park for next to nothing. Uh, and in terms of the convenience, I think the taxpayers out there and the patients out there who have been, who have been watching uh, your presentation here are not very impressed. I would have thought at the very least you would have said, you know what, that was a mistake. Uh, knowing the, the fiscal state that we're in, I'm going to refer to a letter. How much time do we have, uh, Chair? Uh, you have uh, four minutes. Okay, so, you know, uh, here's a letter dated July 19th, 2011. And, and signed by you and addressed to Mr. Rob Nishman uh, of the Ministry of Health. This was in response, this letter, if you recall it, was in response to... Could I have to, a copy of that letter? Yes, I, I don't can. recall it. As a matter of fact, Chair, copies. This, is, th this was in response to an anonymous letter that was written to the Ministry of Health about concerns uh, within Orange. And it spoke about problems at the communication center, uh, patient care, medical dispatch, patient feedback, staffing at the Orange bases, helicopter launch criteria, orientation and training, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, what was interesting about this uh, is that one of your closing paragraphs in this letter, on the last page, under whistleblower policy, uh, you state, this is, this is your comment to the ministry, I quote, the board has no plans to introduce a whistleblower policy at Orange until Ontario introduces similar protection for its residents. Currently, protection for whistleblowers in the public sector is limited and largely unenforced. There's no protection at all for whistleblowers in the private sector in this province. This applies to an organization like Orange. I find that incredible. You know, we have had, uh, I think every member on this committee uh, has had emails and calls and, and, and brown envelopes from people within the organization who are desperate and were desperate to tell us what was going on. Here you had one example of someone actually coming forward to the ministry blowing the whistle on what went on, and they get shut down. Uh, your letter justifies everything. Uh, I don't know who wrote it, but you signed it. Uh, in this letter as well, on page 3, uh, there's a specific reference in the middle of the uh, page entitled Email from Randy LaRue. And you say, as a result of a $2 million shortfall in projected funding from the government, and a further $1.7 million HST negative impact, Orange needed to manage our limited resources. Mr. Belson, this is at a time when you and your fellow directors were hobnobbing it at retreats in Niagara-on-the-Lake and when you were shutting down paramedic facilities and when you were flying to Florida and flying to Europe uh, and, and trying to drum up business about some vision that Dr. Mazza had, and you've, you got your focus off the core mandate that you were initially asked to look after and oversee, and that is emergency services 
for air ambulance here in the province of Ontario. A and what we continue to hear, we've heard it now from your fellow directors, we're hearing it now from you, a very, a very well-organized presentation. You didn't know anything. Had you known, you might not have done anything different. You justify using taxpayer dollars for some vision out there. Uh, I just got this just now, two minutes ago, I got the news that Orange sold two helicopters for $10 million each. You and your board authorized the purchase of those two helicopters, which were not needed. They were going to be spares or for some other purpose. You bought them for $11 million each. So now we're sitting at another loss of $2 million to the taxpayers. Was that a good deal uh, when you signed off on it? I, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I see your presentation. I hear what you're saying. I have to tell you that based on the experience that you have, as a chartered accountant, as someone, as you say, have lectured on governance issues, knowing what you know, to have presided over the disaster that we have at Orange, notwithstanding the lack of oversight by the ministry, I'm with you on that. They didn't do their job. But I can tell you, I believe it was the ministry, the board of directors failed miserably as well. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, instead of acknowledging that, I, I hear nothing but justification from you. It's very disappointing. Was there a question? Thank you. You're, I think we're out of time. You've used up your time for now. If you do want to say anything, you're welcome to. And, and to. Okay, so we'll move on to the NDP. Ms. Jelinas. Uh, I want to come back to a question that we've asked to all of the previous board members. Uh, that is, uh, when we found out that Dr. Mazza was getting a $400,000 a year stipend to provide medical directives. Uh, as late as uh, Tilly went on to his medical leave and then quit. Did you know? When did you find out? Um, came to the surface when, uh, uh, as a result of a request from the ministry to put together Dr. Mazza's compensation, I think um, in my previous testimony I said that was um, in late December at some point. Okay. So when the ministry asked for Dr. Maz's salary, uh, you put that together and then you became aware. Um, it, was, it was the, uh, I, I believe it was the finance department or payroll department that put that number together. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you hadn't signed off on that compensation? No. Let, and, and let me be clear. Back in uh, 2007, I did sign off along with the chair of the Governance and Compensation Committee on a contract with Dr. Mazza to provide services as his medical director. Um, that was a continuation of a previous contract that he had, um, that I was assured that he had uh, from 2005 when Orange was formed, that was signed off. I am now told, I was told subsequently by um, Jacob Bloom and Dr. Mazza, which apparently was a contract that fell over from Sunnybrook and Women's. But nevertheless, in 2007, uh, Luis Navis, who was chair of the Compensation Governance Committee, um, approached me and uh, said, look, we have this uh, um, contract with uh, Dr. Mazza, which is a contract that existed previously, et cetera. I read through the contract. I had a discussion with uh, Mr. Navis concerning, um, you know, was this something that uh, is needed, et cetera. And I signed off on it for that year, yes. And apparently the contract um, um, uh, had a continuation clause in it um, and Dr. Mazza continued to uh, draw money from that um, throughout the years, as I understand. And was the initial contract for the same amount? I don't recall. You'd have to pull out. I think um, somewhere around $60,000 per region something of that nature. Chair, can I ask the witness to get closer to the lady? Sorry. Sorry. I'll do that. Apologies. Okay. Uh, you were the one who alerted the ministry about the contract between Dr. Massa and Dr. Stewart. Correct. 
How did you come to know that? When I started to ask questions, um, again in, in December of 2011, of the um, management team at Orange, um, I was, uh, you know, I, I was, as you can imagine, uh, somewhat unhappy about the fact that payments had been made where there was no supporting invoice. I mean, you know, it's one thing if you've got a supporting invoice that says, yes, I spent the time, I did this, and so on, but there was nothing. Um, you know, I then asked the question, well, who else is getting paid in this organization where there is no supporting invoice? That's against all policy, that's against everything. And uh, one of the, well, there are a couple of things that came up. One is uh, certainly all of the patch physicians uh, were under that, um, under that kind of thing. They had a contract for services and, and they did not submit, as far as I understood, specific invoices, as I was told. But with respect to patch physicians, um, subsequently I was told uh, by Dr. Sadwoski that in fact one of the things that he did was review the performance and time of all of the patch physicians to make sure that uh, this was reasonable still to keep them on. One of the names that came up was uh, uh, the name of uh, Dr. Stewart from, uh, from Mount Sinai and that came up from uh, uh, Mr. Tom Lepine who um, as I, as I mentioned, I had a discussion with a number of the executives uh, rather angry at the issue. Um, and Mr. Lapine said, well, there's, you know, this Dr. Tom Stewart at Mount Sinai and um, uh, Dr. Mazza had engaged him to do something and um, everyone at Orange uh, didn't think that uh, that was necessary or services were being provided. And um, uh, so that you know, it's another one of these things that I just said, okay, well, somebody better look at this. So, um, how did it come to hit the Sudbury Star, the Toronto Star, a year later? I have no idea. I, I think, um, you know, one of the principal investigators, uh, Kevin Donovan, I think as Mr. Wansley referred to him, um, I don't know comes up with this a year later. I mean, in testimony, I mentioned this in testimony, I think, the first time I was here, a year, over a year ago. Okay. So I don't know. So uh, this is, so the compensation to physicians, they were on a retainer. Yes. Uh, their contract were paid, whatever, bi-weekly or every month. Uh, somebody checked that they had actually done some work. They didn't submit a invoice, a timesheet or anything like this, they just got paid. Yes, but I, um, I believe they, they f because they were in charge of uh, particular patient matters, uh, they would have completed um, some information that's required with respect to patient matters because they were, they, they were the ones on the phone dealing with paramedics as paramedics were dealing with patients. Um, so I, I you know, presume in the confines of the medical world there's uh, some confidential documents that are prepared that evidence that the physicians were involved. Okay, so when you realize uh, that there was payments to Dr. Stewart, uh, but he did not fit those criteria where you could trace back that he had been providing care, who did you tell? Um, at that point, I, I think I wrote an, e I think that was an email that I wrote. I previously testified on that. It was an email, I think, that I wrote to Ken Flynn of Internal Audit, um, saying, I think it was part of another email, basically saying, you know, this uh, came to my attention, you should check up on it and, and figure out what's going on. And did you hear back from the ministry? No. You didn't hear anything back? In none of the uh, items that I raised to, uh, uh, to him, um, I think there were it was two correspondences that I raised to him, probably. Um, yeah, the, the one correspondence put Dr. Maz's uh, $400,000 and then Tom Stewart's thing. And then uh, in January 2012, I called him and talked to him about what we had found out about the uh, uh, supposed payments for the uh, weight upgrades. I have not heard back from uh, Mr. Flynn on any of those matters. John? Sure. Uh, there's a, do you recall a correspondence that you received from, from Maria Renzella uh, in 2010 where she 
She requested that for Dr. Moses' role as the medical director for Orange, for CCTU, and for OCC, that he be given an additional stipend for $125,000? I recall that, and, and um, my response back to uh, Maria was, um, uh, that I, I asked the question of whether that was for his role as a patch physician, because I knew that he, you know, occasionally uh, and more frequently in some cases, because of shortages of physicians, sat in and, and did patch physician work. And Maria's response was yes. Okay. And, uh, and so you asked for that clarification. In her letter, she men mentioned something to the effect of that uh, he is actively engaged in a number of quality initiatives, focused on improved efficiency, improved patient outcomes, and that this participation was above and beyond, above the activities normally performed by the medical director. Do you, re do you recall that type of language? Could, yeah, something of that nature. Okay. Uh, and then in addition to this, it's stipulated that the medical director, there's a, a three other kind of specific, specific uh, areas of stipends, that the medical director gets a stipend of uh, 85000 generally, and then the medical director for the CCTU gets a, an annual stipend of another $85,000. And the other position as a medical director of the OCC would, would receive an annual stipend of $135,000. Were you aware of, of those three separate, I guess? I don't stuff? recall those. Okay. I, I asked you a question previously, and I think I, the way I worded it wasn't uh, exactly what I wanted, and I, and I don't fault you for your answer, but mm -hmm. I'm going to try again. Um, sure. My question is, I think what I initially asked, and I think the way you understood it was, you know, going back, is there anything you would have done differently in the board? Given all the information that you had, you, you, you wouldn't have done anything differently. But let's say this specific scenario. You know now all the information you know now. You know that uh, Mr. Dr. Maza's salary, his compensation was far and above and beyond what it should have been, the, the additional $400,000 that he didn't provide services for. You know now about uh, what at the time and the information that you had didn't seem like a kickback, but now it starts to look like the marketing service agreement. And with, with the flow of, of money, it looks, it can have kind of... A, uh, a questionable appearance. With that information now, and you told yourself in the past, what would you have done with that information if you knew that Dr. Mazza, you know, there's some salary issues, you knew that there were some patient care issues, and you knew that there were some issues with uh, that kickback, what would you have done with that information? Well, had I known that, uh, for example, um, Dr. Mazza was um, receiving monies for which he was not providing services, um, I certainly would have uh, taken some measures to, first of all, stop the flow of money, and secondly, um, deal with Dr. Maz's uh, continuing employment. I cannot tell you how dealing with Dr. Maz's continuing employment would have gone, That's right. but it certainly would have been dealt with. Similarly, um, had we received evidence, and I emphasize evidence, um, concerning an unauthorized payment to Augusta, and I will just clarify for you that in the board minutes, approving the Augusta helicopter purchase, there was a specific clause in that agreement that said anything above and beyond of significance to this purchase agreement had to have the board's approval or the signature of Dr. Mazza and Mr. Veltzner. I have never seen any of those additional payments. I have never seen my signature on any of those additional payments. Had I seen an additional payment, it would have gone to the board, it would have gone through a normal review process and presumably determined whether it was appropriate or not. Uh, had we become aware that it was not appropriate, and I think, again, this is a matter of an OPP investigation, because I can tell you I do not know which, you know, whether it was or wasn't. I've seen documents that suggest it was not supposed to have been made. I have not seen a money transfer that actually represents what was paid. So I don't know. All right? But had it been put brought forward as a, uh, an inappropriate payment, 
I can assure you the board would have acted on it. Okay. Thank you. You um, uh, answering questions from my colleague. You made it quite clear that you understand the difference between a not-for-profit corporation and a for-profit. Yes. That when you're um, part of the board of director of a not-for-profit, uh, the expectation of being paid for doing this is is a no-no. You know that. Well, the, no, that's not quite correct. Um, uh, not-for-profit charity status, there is no payment to boards. A not-for-profit, uh, in some instances, there, there is a, a stipend that's paid to a, a board director for attendance at meetings and so on. Okay. Uh, so the reason you accepted the $200,000 plus payment was a, because of the time you spent on the for-profit side? Absolutely. Becoming a director on the for-profit side, particularly um, an operation that handled uh, financial management, um, that handled uh, staffing, that handled um, procurement, and then the other company that uh, operated uh, under Transport Canada license uh, an aviation operation, uh, increases the risk to directors quite substantially. And um, directors typically uh, uh, have a lot more work to do in those situations and are remunerated for that. But, see, I fail to see the difference because when Orange was only the not-for-profit, yes. uh, it did uh, schedule staffing. It did ha make sure that it had the Air Canada worthiness certificate. It did all of that already. No, no. Um, the, the, initial, uh, the initial Orange, uh, pre-2007, um, uh, absolutely did have uh, staffing side, did, did the financial side, um, did the procurement. Uh, it did not have uh, the license to operate an airline. Uh, that was handled by CHL and the third party providers. Didn't have a license to maintain air aircraft, didn't have a license to fly them. So all of that was um, uh, handled by third party providers and, and I've talked about how that was done or not done. Um, I've talked about uh, the reasons why uh, we created uh, Orange Peel as a for-profit mm -hmm. um, and the transfer of non-Ambulance um, Act required staff uh, from Orange, uh, which we had then, by then morphed into a charity status, uh, from Orange into, uh, into Orange Peel. Orange Air came about as we uh, uh, took delivery of the, you know, the first uh, fixed-wing aircraft. Okay, but the procurement f function, the staffing functions were there when you were in the not-for-profit. Board of Directors, the not-for-profit, they got transferred yes. to the for-profit. Yeah. And that suddenly justified paying for what you were doing for free before. Well, it, um, no, the, the, the timing is a little tight on this, but um, Orange One is first created was a not-for-profit, mm -hmm. purely a not-for-profit. And as I testified, I and, and a number of, and all of the directors received a, a modest stipend for the, the board meetings and um, other activities. And in fact, in the first couple of years, I think um, we just did on the basis of, you know, it doesn't matter how many times we meet, uh, this is the maximum. Um, then when things uh, became a little more complicated, um, and uh, uh, Orange Co. and Orange Peel were formed, and Orange became a charity, um, the, uh, the stipends were increased. And, and the difference was that we, because we started to have more meetings, the operation was more complex, uh, we started to provide um, retainers as you know, the chair of a committee, um, each committee meeting, and so on. So under the early days of Orange, it was uh, in the first couple of years, it was relatively straightforward. Um, you had one company, um, a not-for-profit, wasn't a charity. You had one company, uh, fairly straightforward operations. Um, and so rather than trying to complicate matters, we just set a, a, you know, a retainer on an annual basis and left it at that. And it wasn't a lot of money. Uh, as things became more complicated, um, again, we sought the advice of uh, uh, some experienced outsiders to give us advice on what retainers should be and, and so on. Um, but it's a fair amount of work. 
And you feel that the compensation you received was justifiable? Yes. Every one of my additional hours is detailed in, uh, in billings to, our, to the companies involved, uh, detailing what I did, who I did it with, etc. cetera. Um, uh, for example, the additional hours, which were billed at a rate of $250 an hour, which is about uh, anywhere from a half to a third of my normal billing rate. But you knew that the money to Orange Peel was coming directly from the money that was what you call your performance agreement, I call taxpayer. Yes. I, I'm trying really hard to understand your train of thought and your logic. So before, if it comes from the taxpayer, you respect the fact that board of directors do their work voluntarily with a minute stipend that that we can all agree to pay for your babysitter and your gas. I, I think uh, no, I understand. Two hundred thousand dollar buys you a lot of babysitting. Yeah. Um, I, I understand your, your confusion on the point. I, th I think you, you need to understand that in the early years, the operation was, um, um, shall we say, far less complex uh, from the point of view that uh, you had, you know, third party providers doing most of the things. Um, the, the number of staff was fairly small. Um, and as the, uh, you know, the company took on more of the responsibility and more of the operations, uh, things become more complex and, and take more time. It's as simple as that. But uh, yes, the source of the money is the same. Much like the source of the money, whether we pay CHL for, um, you know, uh, flying aircraft and providing aircraft or have, you know, paying a, a finance company for having, you know, pay for the purchase of aircraft for us, it's, it's all the same. The money comes from the performance agreement. The issue with the performance agreement is, you know, uh, the performance agreement set out criteria that we were supposed to deliver a service. And the question of, um, you know, how we delivered that service um, was left to Orange to deal with. And that's, uh, that's straightforward. You're aware that now most of this uh, staffing issue, the procurement issue, everything but is coming back to the not-for-profit, coming back to people who are doing it voluntarily. Orange never grew to be anything but it still is now. Well, I, I, I appreciate your comment, but um, the board, uh, with all respect, that is dealing with Orange today um, is dealing with a company that was not like that five years ago. Um, you know, they, they had this board that's dealing with things today uh, did not need to go through the uh, transition that, that we did, uh, which is not to say they don't have tremendous challenges ahead of them. Um, I would not necessarily agree that it's the best idea to, um, to roll... Uh, peel back into orange. There are some, uh, you know, legal liability issues, um, uh, protection of uh, orange assets and so on that, uh, I, you know, I would want to have a very close look at. Um, but if that's what they choose to do, that's what they choose to do. You'll have, did you want yeah, to go? Just, um, one of the issues that you brought up in, in your comments, and I just want to clarify um, that one area of concern came up that you would you would approach the ministry, give them some information, let them know about the direction you want to go, right. and you didn't get any clear uh, correspondence saying no, don't go in that direction. Right. But you also didn't get now, in retrospect, in hindsight, you didn't get any clear in writing confirmation that they said yes, go ahead with this. That is correct. So moving forward, for other boards or for other organizations or agencies or other uh, entities like Orange that that the ministry provides the sole funding for. Uh, your recommendation to those board members is that if you must or the, the government should provide clear uh, confirmation whether they agree or disagree with the direction that a, that a organization is headed in. And if the board members don't receive that, they should you know, consider that they don't have the support of the government anymore. And perhaps well, I, as, I, as I indicated to my testimony, um, I think you know, when you're on a board 
and whether it was on the board of Hunger College or TSSA or, or any number of the charities and so on that I've been involved in, you know, um, I think you have a right to expect um, open and honest communication uh, from government. I think that's a fundamental right. Um, I think if, if I were to, uh, you know, know now, if I knew then what I know now, um, I certainly uh, um, would have said, what, no written confirmation, uh, nothing more. Right? Um, I would, you know, as I mentioned in my, in my opening statement, um, I think boards would be well advised um, to not rely on no communication, um, verbal, no verbal communication. They no should insist on something in writing and something. I, I think, uh, I think, I think boards. Uh, that makes sense. Are, are well, well advised to get things in Th writing. Thank you. Yes. Just building on, on uh, Ms. Jalan's point, um, do you agree now, understanding that since the primarily, if there had been a for-profit, a separate flow of income, a separate flow of uh, funds coming in, there would be no issue with, your, with uh, the board being remunerated. No one would have an issue with it. And the fact that the, the income coming into any of the entities was still primarily taxpayer dollars, do you see that uh, that's not, that wouldn't be the preferred a choice that you, if, if the flow of money is coming from taxpayer dollars, then ideally the, the remuneration for board members should be very modest. Do you agree with that that sentiment? That generally speaking, that that's a good idea. I, I'm, I'm not certain that I would agree or disagree with that. I think I'd have to study it a little bit more because there are lots of complicated corporate structures uh, that receive public funds. Um, you know where you have potentially these types of situations. I, I, I really would not want to make a blanket statement on that. Fair enough. Um, I would really want to study that. I, but I think, you know, I think it's worthwhile to, um, to study that particular point. Uh, you might take this as a lesson uh, from Orange, uh, that, um, you know, that this perhaps should be more specifically spelled out um, in performance agreements. Thank, Thank you, you. And we'll move to the uh, government. Ms. Jasser. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belsner, I'm going to summarize what I've been hearing this afternoon. Certainly. You were chair of a board that was in receipt of 150 million taxpayers' dollars by 2011. You had a very small board. It sounds like there were six of you, including yourself, uh, certainly during the last few years. Um, most of the members, with the exception of Dr. Lester, uh, seem to have been hand-picked by yourself. Incorrect. How is that incorrect? Um, I certainly identified um, Mr. Pickford and Ms. Beth Coley, two individuals. Um, I did not identify Lauren Crawford. I did not identify um, Luis Navas at the time. I did not identify Dr. Lester. I mentioned Dr. Lester. Okay. Some of whom. Some uh, of you them, approached. Yes. Thank you. Um, when there was a dissenting opinion, uh, i.e., uh, Enola Stoyle, that person was, uh, it was suggested that that person resign for whatever reasons, but certainly from her point of view, at least as we read the quote. I don't um, believe it was on a dissenting opinion. All right. However, that person removed themselves. Yes. Um, you have a CEO who you had actually worked for, and now you're chair of the board of this entity. What it strikes me, and having heard some of my colleagues' comments related to expenses and so on, that you had kind of a cozy group who knew each other very well. And I guess I would have to question the objectivity of that group in supervising, and as you say in your own brief, that you had proper oversight of management's activities and proper stewardship of the company. It just doesn't sound like that. In previous testimony, you even referred to being in some way at the mercy of Dr. Tamaza. This is what it sounds like to me. My reaction would be, uh, you, you refer to us as a cozy group. 
Um, I'd nev I had never met Mr. Luis Navas previously. I'd never met Dr. Lester previously. I'd never met Mr. Lauren Crawford previously. I'd never met Enola Stoll previously. Um, the only people on the board that I'd ever met previously, and I'm other than than happen chance at uh, at <laughs> events, would have been Mr. Pickford, who um, ran uh, was in charge of uh, an international tax practice in the same firm that I was in. Um, but because we we didn't deal with each other, we didn't deal with each other. So I, I object to the phrase of cozy group. Um, we did not socialize uh, uh, with each other, um, uh, other than at uh, board meetings and, and so on. Uh, we have no social friends uh, together. Um, we don't operate in each other's businesses. Um, so I don't understand the reference to the cozy group. I'm uh, telling you the way it appears to me. Well, now, I'm in just terms saying of the, the way it appears to me. That you alluded to the risk now that you were moving into this for-profit group of companies. In fact, the complexity was of your doing. You created this complexity. Did you not have director's liability insurance? Yes. So where was the risk? Why did you require additional compensation to assume that risk? Because the business is more, more complex, takes more time, and, and but you, were you know, the it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, you, which you know, I don't think just Ms. because Shelley you have to. Has pointed out is unnecessary. Just uh, what's unnecessary? We are still. Your core business was running air ambulance in Ontario. It is being run now without that complexity. Well, I, um, I'm not sure that um, the Ontario air ambulance air operation is. Uh, it's brought together with Orange. I think there's some aviation license issues there still, aren't there? So what are you implying? That obtaining aviation licenses was somehow risky for directors? Whenever you're, whenever you're running an aviation company, I think that's riskier than running a, uh, um, a back office company, for example. Yes. Let's turn to the Founders Equity Plan. You're no doubt sure. familiar with that. Uh, it's referenced in the auditor's yeah. report. Uh, did you have any role in the creation of that plan? No. Well, you're chair of the board. What's that got to do with it? Wouldn't I wasn't the chair of the board of OGMI. Wouldn't you have a role in relation to a creation of some new plan within the umbrella of the organization you were, had uh, proper oversight of? I, I failed to understand the question. OGMI was um, a separate entity as uh, being the principal uh, at the time was created. Uh, and again, if you look at the timing, it's created in, in early 2011 or mid-2011, wherever it was, uh, to hold the initial shares of the limited partnership that would be invested into by third-party investors. Um, that particular um, company as, a, as a, if you like, the initial holder of the shares, um, would I have, uh, you know, pay particular in, uh, planning interest in, the, uh, in that uh, agreement? No. Did no. you res uh, expect to receive any benefit from this founder's equity plan? No, not at all. In fact, uh, you know, the board members, uh, uh, after having received the, uh, you know, the notice, I know we, we chatted amongst ourselves and uh, in fact it even sought uh, some legal advice on how we could allocate those uh, shares over to Orange because we had not looked for any any benefit or remuneration out of this thing uh, and so we, we consulted with uh, Cynthia Heinz uh, who uh, had written back to us um, in a variety of memos saying this was complicated, that was complicated, would have to be done in this trust or that trust or so on. We never did get around to finally doing that because so events overtook us, but that's what... So you, as the chair of Orange, yes. had no role in the creation of the Founders' Equity Plan? That is correct. Uh, why would you think that the Auditor General would have had difficulty in receiving documents in relation to this plan? Well, I, uh, the Auditor General was in doing an audit of, uh, of Orange. 
and um, I know when the request came uh, through Orange uh, from the Auditor General to uh, receive copies of certain documents that were on the, if you like, other side of the fence, um, Orange had no uh, control of, of oversight or uh, had no controlling interest, if you like, in, in, that, in that side of the operation. Um, Who and did? So Who did? Uh, that would have been uh, uh, Orange Global GP Board. And who was chair of that board? I was chair of that board. So surely then you had a role in the creation of the plan? I repeat again, I had no role in the creation of the plan. But you were the chair of that particular private of, sector entity? Of the GP Board, yes. Well, I'm totally bewildered. Uh, so when you did find out that the Auditor yes. General was having difficulty obtaining documents, uh, were you involved in any of those discussions? Uh, what did you say to that request? Um, as I recall, the request came through. It went to, um, the request went to, uh, to Dr. Mazza, who was, uh, uh, because it was a Founders' Equity Plan, that, which is um, part of uh, OGMI, and Dr. Mazza is the principal shareholder of OGMI. The request went to him. He refused the request, and that was it. When you say OGMI, Orange Global Management Inc., is Correct. that? Um, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Belsner. I just, uh, I've been following these proceedings, and I've also was there when some of the other directors, we asked questions. And what I heard from a lot of the other directors was a certain sense of regret that, you know, a certain sorry? sense of regret that yes. things could have been different. I have to be honest, I haven't heard that from you at all today, not in your, uh, I guess, formal submission earlier on and the exchanges that have been going on. So I thought I'd ask the question directly. Do you regret anything at all in your time as board of Orange, as chair of the board of Orange in your various capacities? I guess there were a few boards. Absolutely. There's lots of things I regret. Can you give me some examples of what you regret? Well, you know, having, having learned of, of uh, apparently um, negative impacts, apparent negative impacts to uh, orange patients, um, I certainly regret that um, information didn't come to us uh, on a timely basis and, and deeply enough for us to be able to, uh, so, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sincerely regret that. Let me rephrase that. I'm not talking about regret of circumstances, but regret in terms of what you have done, your actions. Well, as I, you know, as I said before in my testimony, you know, knowing now, um, you know, some of the things that have come out, um, I certainly regret that uh, I wasn't able to deduce these things in the past. Um, you know, I've always thought, uh, thought myself as being a, a fairly conscientious and, uh, you know, delve into details um, as necessary. Um, I would say, though, that I, I don't know that I could have done anything different. I just wish I could have, okay. you know. So, you know, from that point of view, yes, I'd certainly regret uh, what everybody's had to go through in the last uh, couple of years. It's a terrible thing. Um, the impact on uh, former employees of Orange, the impact on uh, Ontario patients, the impact on all of you, uh, the impact on me personally, um, uh, my, you know, former board members, uh, alive and deceased. Um, you know, I, I think Dr. Lester put it, put it well. You know, you spend a lot of time in your life uh, trying to do the right thing. And this is something that um, my history will show. Uh, I spent a lot of years doing the absolute right thing okay. to the best of my ability. I certainly regret that I wasn't um, able to figure this out earlier, absolutely. So let me ask you a more specific question. You're an auditor, you're a chartered accountant. Yes. Uh, do you regret, for instance, submitting movie tickets when you were on your various trips to the taxpayer given that you were already taking $200,000 as a director's fee? Do you regret uh, that? I, I don't recall submitting movie tickets. I, I 
But if you did, I mean, we have some records well, that it, show that you did. You know, if I if I submitted, you know, an invoice for a muffin or we're movie, talking movie tickets, not movie muffins. Tickets, I, you know, I would regret that, sure. You would regret that. Yeah. So given that, I mean, you know, you keep saying that you were a good steward, but it shows a lapse of judgment that you would ding the taxpayer, frankly, for something as small as movie tickets. That's certain, that's well, uh, just, let me just, finish, uh, let me finish. No, 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 before you finish, mm -hmm. you're making an accusation that I dinged the taxpayer for movie tickets. Um, and, and, you know, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but I don't, honestly don't recall that I did. And if you can show me an expense report that I submitted that had a movie ticket on it, I, you know, I'd be pleased to say that I regret that, but I don't recall that, honestly. Okay, let's just move on. You know, uh, I just want to go back to the whole idea. Earlier in your testimony, I heard you say that of the 1,500 hours in the last year that you spent on board work, the bulk of it was for not-for-profit, on the not-for-profit area. That's what I heard. A lot of it was on the charities, yeah, Orange, uh, Orange yeah. Foundation, and so on, yeah. So given that the bulk of your time was for not-for-profit activities, how do you justify a $200,000 director's fee for the for-profit organization where you spent, according to your own testimony, very little time? Well, I didn't say I spent very little time. I spent a considerable amount of time. Um, and, uh, you know, my time is uh, very adequately recorded in the board minutes um, where I attended every board meeting, every committee meeting. Um, I think um, it's fair to say that if my attendance wasn't uh, darn near 99.9 percent, it would be unusual. And mm -hmm. there were a lot of meetings. Uh, my time is also very well spelled out in the invoices that I sent for additional fees uh, at $250 an hour for specific duties as requested. Um, not padded, not overinflated, um, you know, and lots of time that I provided um, to promote Orange, to raise funds for Orange, to, you know, so I, I don't understand. How many board meetings for the for-profit entity would there have been in that one year period? At a minimum, um, you would have, at a minimum, you would have uh, four board meetings, uh, four meetings of the operations committee, uh, four meetings of the uh, compensation and governance committee, four meetings of the finance committee. Mm -hmm. um, All on different dates or same day, but just they, they would go over continuing days. We, we tried, it's not always possible. For example, um, you know, obviously you, you couldn't have uh, an operations committee meeting and a finance committee meeting the same day as a board meeting. It just didn't make sense because, yes. you know, you need to kind of deal with information mm -hmm. changes. So on. meetings were scheduled as information was best available, um, you know, through, through dealings with uh, uh, the board secretary and so on. Just wondering why you needed five, uh, four compensation meetings. Um, well, it, uh, sort of speaks to your priorities, I guess. But well, it does because um, if, if you recall, um, or you may not recall, that uh, compensation included the rather difficult matters of union negotiations, um, and quite a number of the staff at. Um, at the organization were part of uh, CAW, OPSU, and uh, then the other organization, I can't remember, that deals with pilots. Um, and so, uh, in particular, you know, there were uh, some periods of time when there were extensive negotiations going on uh, between um, uh, then Rhoda Beecher, uh, who represented uh, the company and the various unions that impacted all of the companies. And so uh, the board, um, through the Governance Compensation Committee, received, uh, as necessary, uh, quite a number of updates and updates on the issues okay. that were there, okay? Um, the, the most difficult, I can tell you of those, the most difficult of those issues had to deal with uh, paramedics and their union. Um, simply... Uh, I, I get, yeah, I get, you get the idea. Yeah, okay. I get, okay. Uh, I'm just going to move on to the idea of using taxpayer dollars to sure. fund a for-profit organization. So, you know, I know you keep saying the money came through the performance agreement and technically you're right, but at the end of the day, the money that came through the performance agreement is taxes that I paid and probably you paid. Right. So I'm just wondering, as a chartered accountant, as a trained accountant, surely there's a Chinese wall. You have the for-profit, 
You have the not-for-profit, the taxpayer funds the not-for-profit in socialized medicine. Now we're moving into a territory of for-profit. Why would you, given your you know, fiscal fiduciary background, why would you authorize the flow of taxpayer dollars to a risk, risk in a high-risk venture in the for-profit world instead of going to the markets for seed money? Well, no, we essentially went to the market for that uh, high-risk venture. Mm -hmm. um, when we initially created the, uh, uh, the two for-profits, um, uh, Orange Peel and uh, Orange Air, um, Orange Peel was initially created as a for-profit in order to give the company, Orange, or the, the group, the flexibility to conduct uh, management consulting, uh, uh, paramedic training for others, and to flow those uh, monies uh, back into the operation. No, I, I get the intent. I'm, I'm right. asking, At why time, would taxpayer dollars be used? I'm just trying to understand, were you a good steward of taxpayer dollars to move money to a for-profit venture? That's all I want to know. Not, the re not you know, what your company was going to do and the great plans. Just uh, ideologically or philosophically. Well, I, I, I would just rephrase the question and say, um, there's nothing wrong with, with having services delivered f from a for-profit entity as long as the profits from that entity revert back. Right. So, you're, so all over again, you would have no problem if you were in a similar position flowing taxpayer dollars to a for-profit entity. That's what you're telling me. For a, for a, wholly, for, for a wholly owned, controlled for-profit entity? I, I so no see. lessons have been learned here? Well, there's certainly some lessons that have been learned. I mean, certainly um, I would, as I said in my testimony, I would uh, certainly suggest that the performance agreement um, that was signed back in 2005, 2006, um, you know, I don't think it was the best agreement. Yeah. You know, um, and there were a number of suggestions made um, in 2007, 2008, to, uh, to have that agreement amended. Um, I would repeat, I don't understand why um, that agreement was not amended uh, by government. Um, certainly government had the right uh, to amend the agreement. Um, and, and so it's just, you know, I can't say anything more about that. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming before the committee. Thank you. Again, Mr. Pelsner. And this meeting is adjourned.